Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Tent of Abraham. I'm Tamir Kreisman from Jerusalem, Israel. And we continue with Pirkei Derby Eliezer. First, let us give praise to Hashem. We are in the topic of repentance, the way back home. This should speak to each and every one of us. And uh, we're still in chapter 43. This is 43C, and this one is called King Menashe. Okay. Rabbi Yehoshua says, You should know the power of Teshuvah. Come and see from Menashe, son of Hezekiah. So, just so you have an idea of the power of tshuva, so you really understand how anything you may have done that you think is so terrible, King Menashe is here to make you feel a whole lot better about yourself. So, as always, to know who a man is, we must first know where he comes from, right? We all have a past. I have a past that is very different than how I live today. And yet, here I am telling you about tshuva. So, listen up. So... Who, who is the past of King Menashe? That would be the great King Hezekiah of Judah. That's his father. Now, there's going to be a lot of reading for the sake of background. So let's climb this glorious tree in order to see just how far the apple falls. But then you'll find out the hill is actually slanted and the apple rolled right back to the tree. Okay, so we start with Hezekiah, the great king of Judah and father of Menashe. He was the 12th king uh, from David, and since the end of the days of Solomon, and since the kingdom of Israel split Israel and Judah, right? Both kingdoms of Israel and Judah were in a steady decline, right? The peak was pretty much so Solomon with the temple, afterwards they split. But along comes Hezekiah and cleans up the kingdom. Second Chronicles 29. Uh, we'll start with verse 1 and 2. Hezekiah became king at the age of 25 years, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Aviah, the daughter of Ze uh, Bat Zechariahu. And he did what was proper in the eyes of the Lord all the days, uh, as all that his father David had done. He cleanses and purifies and rededicates the temple, he reestablishes the Lord's holy days and feasts, he smashes the idols, altars, and all the foreign temples, right? He brings back the people of Judah to unity as one nation under God. Remember, so this guy's thing was destroying idolatry, constantly battling with idolatry. Remember that. It'll come into play. So let's see what the book says in 2 Kings 18. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, like all that his father David had done. And he abolished the high places and smashed the monuments and cut down the Asherah and crushed the, uh, the, uh, the copper serpents that Moses had made because they took that. They used it as idolatry. For until those days, the children of Israel were burning incense to it. And he called it Nechushtan from Nachash. He trusted in the God of Israel there was none like him among all the kings of Judah who were after him, nor were there before him. This is a very big deal. He cleaved to the Lord. He did not turn away from following him. He kept his commandments, which he had commanded Moses. Now the Lord was with him in everything he ventured. He succeeded and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Good for you. He did great things in his time, including some things we've already learned about in earlier teachings. He fortified the extended walls of Jerusalem. He routed the water that it should flow within the city walls, right? As we know, take the water, take the city. Once everything was done and all Israel did tshuva, that is when uh, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came with his million-man army and laid siege to Jerusalem. If you recall, this is when Hezekiah prayed to God saying, I'm totally paraphrasing here, by the way, okay? I did everything you asked. Why have you brought this calamity upon us? Remember, he did everything. He brought the people to Tshuva. He cleansed the temple. Everything was going perfect. And that's when God brought this calamity. And they couldn't get out of it, right? They were outmanned, outgunned. To which God answers, listen now. I brought this upon you because you did everything I asked. Now you will witness my vengeance as they will fall at your feet. You won't even have to fight. Don't worry about it. So then what happened the next morning? That night, 185,000 of Sennacherib, Sennacherib's generals were killed that night by the angel of the Lord. And the rest fled. Again, there was a million-man army, 185,000 of his generals. 
Not a single arrowhead was found within Jerusalem, just as it's written in 2 Kings uh, 19. Uh, we'll start with verse 32. Therefore, so, uh, so has the Lord said concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not enter the city, neither shall he shoot there an arrow, nor shall he advance upon it with a shield, nor shall he pile up a siege mound against it. By the way he comes, he shall return. And this city he shall not enter, says the Lord. Why? Because the king of Israel, of Judah, and Judah did good, right? And I will protect this city to save it for my sake and for the sake of my servant David, his lineage. And it came to pass on that night that the angel of the Lord went out and slew 185,000 of his camp, of, of the camp of Assyria. And they arose in the morning, and behold, they were all dead corpses. And Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, left and went away, and he returned and dwelt in Nineveh. By the way, the Talmud in uh, Masechet Sanhedrin 94a says that he was to be Mashiach ben David of his generation, but he missed his opportunity because he didn't give thanks to God for this miraculous event. What happened, right? Or not enough recognition. Later, Hezekiah fell gravely ill and was on death's door when he prayed to God for more time, right? 2 Kings 20. In those days, Hezekiah became critically ill when Isaiah, the son of Amos, the prophet, came to him, so Isaiah was his prophet at the time, and said to him, so has the Lord said, give orders to your household, for you are going to die and you shall not live. That's okay, prophet of the Lord. This is what he's telling me right now. That's um, it's a little bit discouraging. And he turned his face towards the wall, Hezekiah did, and prayed to the Lord, saying, Please, O Lord, remember now how I walked before you truly and wholeheartedly, and I did what was good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept profusely. And it was when Isaiah had not gone out to the inner court, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and say to Hezekiah, the ruler of my people. So has the Lord God of your father David said, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, behold, I shall heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. And I will add fifteen years to your life, and I will ha uh, and I will save you from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will save you and this city, and I will protect this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Right? Now, why did God choose to shorten his life initially? Because he refused to get married at the time. What was the thing that kind of, um, we'll call it, triggered this in a sense? So he he kind of boasted, not personally, right? But he showed off the temple vessels to foreign kings. He should not have done this. This is the equivalent of sharing secrets of the Torah with the Gentile nations. You're not supposed to do this. Everything has a very certain order and you have to be very, um, there has to be the right environment to do so. But you don't go sharing these secrets of the inner chamber of the temple vessels with foreign kings. And so that's why he fell ill. But again, he was going to, he might have come out of it, but because he didn't have any, wasn't married and didn't have any kids, that was it, right? It's the same reason why uh, Nadav and Avihu, the two sons of Aaron, they weren't married at the time. It says a man that is not married is not a complete man, right? Because man is actually male and female. Zachal male and female, he created them. So man is both male and female. All right. So the reason he refused, right? Uh, to get married up until that point was because he saw through Racha Kodesh that his children would do tremendous evil. And so he decided not to even go there, right? But as we know, the Torah tells us already in Genesis that it is not good for man to be alone as well as to be fruitful and multiply. And so what will become of his descendants is not in his hands, right? But rather all part of God's plan. And so as a tikkun or rectification for following uh, his own understanding uh, that was completely sincere, right? He's like, my sons are going to be idolaters. I'm just not going to have sons, right? But the you cannot go against the command of the Torah, even though you're sure what the outcome is going to be. That is already beyond you, right? So his intentions were sincere for the sake of God, but God don't play that. He can take care of himself, right? Okay, the great prophet Isaiah, who was Hezekiah's prophet at the time, gave his own daughter in the hand in the hand of marriage to the king. Hezekiah's argument was this: perhaps we can combine both our merits. I'm a righteous king. I'm sure he didn't use those words because I'm, you know, 
I'm in good standing with God. You are obviously the prophet Isaiah. Give me your daughter and maybe the kids that'll come out, they won't be so bad, right? They won't be so wicked. He then married Isaiah's daughter and she bore him two sons, Ravshakah of all names and Menashe. Ravshakah was, I say of all names because when the Assyrians came to the wall, Ravshakah was, it said that it was a, one of, it was either a Hebrew man, like a Jew, um, speaking Hebrew to the people in Jerusalem to scare them on behalf of the Assyrians, or he was an Assyrian who knew how to speak Hebrew. Some Mepharshim say that it was Menashe's son, but timeline-wise, it has, it's, it's impossible, right? Because he gave him another 15 years. He reigned only 29 years. So the last 15 years that he got, he wasn't married at that point. These events are not in that order at all, okay? But again, it's like, oh, because they got the same name. So why did he name his kid this? Who knows? Anyway, not the point. So Rav Shaka and Menashe. Menashe. We know where this is going, right? The question is, how could a righteous man have wicked children? This question also reminds us of who? Abraham, who had Ishmael, not Sarah, because Sarah had Isaac, right? But what of Isaac and Rivka? Both of them were righteous, and they had Asaph. Hagar had Ishmael. There is an answer for these questions. Check this out. As the leader of the generation, be it the patriarchs or the righteous king of Judah. In Sefer Likutei Avot, chapter 2, it says the following. For as the king is to the people... Uh, for for as the king is to the people, as the body is to the head, right? Always. Like I've told you this before, the face of our generation are the leaders. Look at your president. Look at our clown and so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's clown city, right? That is, they are the face of the generation. This is what is going on everywhere else. Just look at that, Okay. And as all the uh, and as all the passions in the body rise above to the head and mind and confuse the mind, right? I'm hungry. Got to go get food. I'm feeling other kind of urges. Got to go handle that, right? So the body, the physical body, is now controlling the mind as it is in this world. So the thoughts of the crowd rise above to the king's mind and confuse his mind. And so while the husband and wife are together in unity, the thoughts that inhabit their minds at that very moment, be it conscious or subconscious, will draw that specific type of soul down to this world. And since Hezekiah was dealing with destroying idols and idolatry all the time, like we said, that was his focus, right? To do this, it was occupying his thoughts and grabbed by the Sitra Achra, by the other side, making his offspring idolaters on steroids. You see, his son Rav Shakeh may have been, like we said, the Assyrian who spoke Hebrew, taunting the inhabitants of Jerusalem during the besiegement, and was burned by the angel of the Lord that very night. So whether it's his son or not, again, timeline doesn't work out, but the Rav Shakeh who spoke to Israel that night from the Assyrian camp, he was one of the 85,000 who got burnt alive. And the time, uh, so like we said, timeline doesn't necessarily add up. But now we can, um, uh, oh, but regardless, Rav Shaket, he ended up worshiping wood and stone anyway. He was not king, right? He was killed off. But now we get to Menashe, okay? And really just many wicked things that this guy did in his life. We're going to go through everything until he did tshuva. Now, now that we have all his background as to where he came from, let's see who he was. Come and see from Menashe, son of Hezekiah, who perpetrated all the evil abominations in the world. And he did much evil and sacrifice to foreign gods. It was said of Menashe that there was not a single type of idolatry that he did not do. Any idol worship from all the nations from everywhere. If it was there, he was into it. Let's read a bit about it from uh, 2 Chronicles 33, and we'll, we'll get an idea. You'll notice we're going from Kings to Chronicles back and forth. It kind of fills in the blanks. Menashe was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 
in Jerusalem 55 years. And he did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord, like the abominations of the nations that the Lord had driven out from before the children of Israel. And he rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had demolished. And he erected altars to the Baalim. And he made the Asherot, the Asherah trees, right? And he prostrated himself to the entire host of heaven. And he worshipped them. Lekol Tzva Shamaim. These are the other Elohim, right? Angels are also known as Elohim. God said, Lo yelecha Elohim acherim al panai. You will not have other Elohim al panai. Jacob was wrestling with the angel of death, and he saw the face of Elohim. And Manoach, Samson's father, and his wife saw the face of Elohim, and that's what, meaning an angel, and he was afraid he was going to die. So Elohim is also referring to angels. Okay, so he worshipped all the angels and everything. Cre other created beings. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, concerning which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem my name shall be forever. Uh-oh. And he built altars to the entire host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he passed his sons through fire in the valley of Ben-Hinom. Begay Ben-Hinom. What does it sound like? Gay Ben-Hinom? Gehenom. Right? Where is Gay Ben-Hinom? It is a valley... Um, between the promenade where the the lookout overlooking temple mount that's where uh, in the king and uh, the uh, city of david video i'm standing there with my brother overlooking temple mount there's a big valley over there that's where abraham stood when he was with isaac ishmael and uh, eliezer and they said that's where they saw the mountain on fire only the two of them did and they had to literally go through the valley of the shadow of death. This is likely what David wrote the Psalms about. He had to go down in order, he had to descend into Gehenom, Geben Hinom, in order to then ascend to Temple Mount. He passed his sons through the fire in the valley of Ben Hinom. He practiced soothsaying, divination, and sorcery, and he consulted necromancers and those who divined by the uh, Jiboa bone. Okay, he did much that was evil in the eyes of the Lord to provoke him everything. And he placed the graven image of an idol that he made in the house of God concerning which God had said to David and his son Solomon in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I will establish my name forever. And I will not continue to remove Israel's feet from under uh, uh, from the land that I've given their forefathers if they will build, if they will but observe to do that I've commanded them according to the law, according to all the law that the statutes and the ordinances that Moses, my servant, commanded them. And Menashe led Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem astray to do what was evil, more than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed from before the children of Israel. So at that point, Menashe and Judah were more idolatrous than the seven Canaanite nations that God said, get them out because their stuff is abominable. And the Lord spoke to Menashe and to his people, but they did not listen. All right. So we know that God speaks through the prophets. So let's jump now to 2 Kings 21 and see what God said. And the Lord spoke through his servants, the prophets, saying, Since Menashe has committed these abominations, he has done more wickedly than all the Amorites who were before him and caused Judah to sin with his idols. Therefore, has the Lord God of Israel, as the Lord God of Israel said, Behold, I bring calamity on Jerusalem and Judah concerning which the two ears of those who hear it will tingle. And I will stretch over the Jer Jerusalem, the measuring line of Samaria and the plumb line of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish. He wipes and turns it upside down. And I will forsake the remnants of my heritage, and I will deliver them into the hands of their enemies, and they will become plunder and prey for all their enemies. Since they did what was evil in my eyes, and they constantly provoked me since the day that their forefathers left Egypt until this day. Is this a true statement? It depends who you ask, right? Because... Yes, there were wicked ones, there were evil ones in every generation, but not as a whole. If we were all perfect, perfect all the time as, as we needed to be, it would have been over a long time ago. So God is obviously talking about in every generation. Today, if you tell people you keep two Shabbos properly, if Israel, in the land of Israel, kept two Shabbatot properly, Mashiach would come. 
let's say a third of the country would do it. The other Jews would be like, no, I'm not doing it. That's great. Their grandparents also survived the Holocaust because they or were in the Holocaust because they were Jews. And yet they won't do it. We always got those. It's okay. Their, their time is coming too. Remember, 20% are surviving. That's it. Moreover, Menashe shed very much innocent blood until he filled Jerusalem from one end to the other beside his sin that he caused Judah to commit to do what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And the rest of the events of Menashe and all that he did and his sin, which he sinned, are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. So this is why we bounce back and forth and Menashe slept with his forefathers and was burned uh burned and was buried in the garden of his house in the garden of Uzzah and his son Ammon reigned in his stead so what did God bring upon Menashe as a result of his behavior because just here it says that he was bad right so that was kings now let's bounce back to chronicles uh, to Chronicles 33, picking up from verse 11, which is similar to what it says in our text. And the Lord brought upon them the generals of the kings of Assyria. They came back. And they seized Menashe with hooks and bound him with the copper chains and brought him to Babylon. And as our text says, they grabbed him and dragged him by his hair to Babylon. And when he was distressed, he entreated the Lord his God and he humbled himself greatly before the Lord of his fathers. What distress specifically is Chronicles referring to over here? Let's read from our text, from Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. Okay, we're bringing in all the sources that tell the story from different angles. This is how we get a much more complete picture. They placed him in a massive pot of water and turned up the flames in order to boil him alive. Okay, and there in the pot, he cried out to all the other gods he sacrificed to, and none of them answered him. He said to himself, I shall call upon the God of my forefathers. Perhaps he will do wonders to me as he did to my father. Now, before we continue, and we know what God answered him, right? Do we think we know everything that he did? You think that was bad? Hold on. There's more. I mean, I'm, yeah, he definitely did the worst. We read some of the worst things that he did, but some of the other things you don't know about, it'd be, and you'll be saying like, what? Really? Okay, so here we go. Masechet Yevamot 49b. Ready? Rabbi Shimon ben Azai said, I found a scroll recording people's lineages. The Gemara cites uh, an expanded version of the content of the scroll. Found these scrolls, these, okay? Like original content. It is taught in a bright time that Rabbi Shimon ben Azai said, I found a scroll recording people's lineages in Jerusalem, and it was written in it that so-and-so, that let's say, here's what's written in the scroll, that this individual is a mamzer, is a bastard from an adulterous union with a married woman. And it was also written it, uh, written in it, the teachings of Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov uh, measure only a kav, but are clean and accurate. And so the halacha is decided in accordance with his opinion. And it, that's great. How is it relevant? And that's not relevant. And it was written in it, Menashe, our guy, king of Israel, killed Isaiah the prophet. What did we just read? Rava said, Menashe judged him as a false witness for issuing statements contradicting the Torah and only then killed him. So I want you to notice now that the questions and false accusations here by Menashe are very reminiscent of the Edomites and their messianic lackeys, right? Who accuse and judge with zero understanding. How many times have we seen them say, yeah, the Talmud, it reverses the word of God. You don't even keep the written word of God. What are you telling me now about the Talmud? So many things were coming out that are just absolutely false. You're bashing something, but you know nothing of it, right? Guess what? Menashe said to Isaiah, Moses, you're... And by the way, these are legitimate que These are legitimate questions, but look what Isaiah... He knows exactly who he's talking to, as should you. Menashe said to Isaiah, Moses, your master, said in the Torah... And he said, you cannot see my face for man cannot see me and live, right? Exodus thirty three twenty. And yet you said, meaning he's saying to Isaiah, I saw the Lord sitting upon a high and lofty throne in Isaiah 6, 1. 
Mo right? Okay. Moses, your master said, For which great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call upon him? Deuteronomy 4, 7. And yet you said, Grandpa, see the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You said he's near all the time, right? But now you're saying call upon him only when he is near, implying that he's not always near. This is from Isaiah 55, 6, which implies that God is not always near. Moses, your master said, I will fulfill the number of your days in Exodus 23, 26, which implies that each individual has a preordained allotted lifespan that, can, that he cannot outlive. And yet you said in a prophecy to King Hezekiah, dad, and I will add to your days 15 years, 2 Kings 20, verse 6. So like we said, these are all excellent questions. We, Israel, actually have the answers, and yes, we will definitely be answering these questions right now. However, these fools, these, these fools that ask these questions with this connotation, they, do, they don't do so in order to receive some sort of answer, but they do it to try, to try and make like, oh yeah, so why don't you tell me about, oh, okay, no problem. Remember, these are the same people who believe that God looks like a man, okay? That should, that should be enough. I'm so, okay. And the way you deal with these people is by having the same understanding of Isaiah as who stood before him. Isaiah said to himself, this is written, I know him, i.e. Menashe, that he will not accept whatever explanation that I will say to him to resolve my prophecies with the words of the Torah. So in other words, Isaiah the prophet saying, I can, of course, answer these questions simply, easily. But I know he didn't ask me because he really wants to learn. He asked me to kind of, you know, vindicate himself. And even if I say to him, Isaiah continues, and even if I say to him, I will make him into an international transgressor since he will kill me anyway. In other words, don't do what you're about to do. In other words, it doesn't matter what I say to him, he's going to kill me anyway. So Isaiah knew, I'm telling you this now is my, my words, Isaiah knew he was about to be killed by his grandson. And he also knew that there was no way out of there for him right? So then why did Menashe ask these questions anyway, if the truth doesn't even matter to him? Like we said, it was for him or any other delusional individual who will not see or accept truth because that would make them wrong. And we know that most people, especially idolaters, would rather die than be wrong. Therefore, in order to escape, we go back to, we go back to the Talmud, in order to escape, he uttered a divine name, and he was swallowed within a cedar tree. They could, they knew exactly these names, and then they could do magic, right? So his guards were chasing him. He said a name, whoosh, disappeared right into a tree. Menashe's servants then cut that tree down. They brought it and sawed through it and killed him. And when the saw reached to where his mouth was, that's where he died. In other words, they killed him, they decapitated him from his mouth area. He died specifically at this point due to that which he said from Isaiah 6, 5. In the, I am in the midst of a people of unclean, uh, in the midst of people of unclean lips, I dwell. He was punished for referring to Israel in a derogatory manner. You see, that's why we see in the few verses after this, uh, this thing took place, he was saying what, what he said, it wasn't a good thing. So from Isaiah 6, verse 5, and I said, woe is to me for I am a man of unclean lips and amidst of a people of unclean lips. I dwell for the king, the Lord of hosts, have my eyes seen. And one of the seraphim flew to me and in his hand was a glowing coal with tongs. He had taken it from upon the altar and he caused it to touch my mouth. And he said, behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity shall be removed, and your sin shall be atoned for. You understand? That would be the sin for, for talking bad about Israel. And the reason he wasn't ended right then and there was because he still had work to do. It wasn't because he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. It's because he said, I'm among a people of unclean lips. Remember, um, 
uh, I not Isaiah, uh, Elijah the prophet, right? When he told God, all your people, they bowed to Baal, they're gone, they're all rebelling, all this and that. And he said, no, there's still 7,000 whose knees did not bend, right? So that's where he basically rebuked Isaiah, said, okay, I think you've been alive for long enough, buddy. Come up here. All right, so... He still, so Isaiah still had work to do. So Menashe killed his own grandfather, Isaiah the prophet. But if you think that we're done, no, you are mistaken. As our sages still take the time to address Menashe's questions, as crooked as they may be, why would they do this? Why would they, why would they entertain the, uh, the, the questions of an idolatrous king who killed his grandfather? Because this is what it says in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, 2.14. Rabbi Lazar said, be diligent in the study of Torah and know how to answer an apikoros. What is, who is an apikoros? Apikoros is a heretic. So let's continue from Talmud. You see, they lived that way back in the day also. The Gemara asks, in any case, as Menashe pointed out, these verses contradict each other. How are these contradictions to be resolved? The Gemara resolved the first contradiction, I saw the Lord, is to be understood as it is taught in Abraita. All the prophets observed that where he said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, right? All the prophets observed their prophecies through an obscure looking glass, Aspaklaria, it says. Their prophecies were given as metaphoric visions, but were not a direct perception of the matter. However, you guys understand what I just said? They're seeing images. They're showing, they're showed what God wants them to see. And then they give their own limited understanding and interpretation of what they saw, right? It wasn't exactly like that. However, Moses, our master, Moshe Rabbeinu, observed his prophecies through a clear looking glass, i.e. he gained a direct and accurate perception of the matter. You want prophecy? Read the five books of Moses, okay? That's prophecy right there. That's what everything is based on. So do you understand? A prophet can only describe what they are shown in a very limited way, as what they are seeing is also very limited to begin with. The best example of this is regarding the Merkava of Ezekiel, right? Chapter 1. Every description, uh, every descriptive word he used there started with, in the and I saw in the likeness of, a kind of, sort of like, in the resemblance of, and so on and so forth. No, you did not see a man sitting on a throne. I saw something of the likeness of the throne with sort of something that would resemble a humanoid man type of situation sitting upon it. The Edomites read it, they're like, clearly he saw what's-his-face on the throne there. Obviously, not, not obviously. So again, all this stuff is so important. Otherwise, you might think like them, that God has an image or that he looks like a man. Remember the Ten Commandments. God said that was impossible both before, during, and after. So what Isaiah saw was his interpretation of what God showed him. Exactly what we needed to understand from this. Just enough to get the Edomites and Messianics to do their thing and for us to be like, we know it's not what they think, obviously. And we're just going to keep moving forward. The Gemara resolves the second contradiction, Isaiah's prophecy. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Does not contradict the verse in the Torah that God is near to his nation whenever we call upon him. Because this prophecy of Isaiah was made with regard to the individual and that this verse in the Torah is stated with regard to the community, as the prayer of the community is always accepted. Now remember, we know that all Israel are tied to one another. Kol Yisrael arevim zelazeh. United we stand, united we fall. This is by design. So the Gemara asks, and when, uh, and when is the time that God is to be found near to the individual? Rav Nachman said to Rabbah Bar Avua, who said, these are the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Right? We've learned about this. As there are auspicious days and times where God metaphorically inclines his metaphoric ear for our sake. You understand? Elul, Anil Dodi, Vedodi Li. Elul, everybody knows that the king is in the field the month before going into Rosh Hashanah. These are auspicious times. Shabbat, Rosh Chodesh, certain high holidays, certain festivals certain times of day, certain times of night. 
I'm listening to the three times that we're supposed to pray. These are auspicious times. This is when God is now listening. Can you pray to God at any point in time? Of course, but this is exactly what he's talking about. Community-wise and the individual. Okay? This isn't even difficult to understand. You guys get this. So if God's feasts and fast days, which he gave us, each having its own prayers, actions, ceremonies, and general focus. Let's continue. The resolution of the third contradiction from the verse, I will fulfill the number of your days, is subject to a dispute between the Tanaim, as it is taught in the Brita. The verse states, I will fulfill the number of your days. Fulfill the number of your days. These are the years of the generations, i.e. the allotted lifespan that is preordained for each individual from birth. If he is deserving, God completes his allotted lifespan. If he is not deserving, God reduces his lifespan. Classic examples in the Torah. This would be, let's say, Joseph and Joshua. They were both supposed to live to be 120 years old, just like Moses, who completed his life perfectly, right? Because Joseph allowed his brothers to refer to themselves and their father, Jacob, as his slave 10 times without his objection, God removed 10 years from his allotted lifespan. And Joshua dragged his feet a bit with destroying the Amorites in the land, right? Because he knew that once the task was completed, that he would die. So he went a little bit slower, right? So God sped things along and took him 10 years before his allotted time. When God told Moses, listen, finish writing the thing, uh, finish telling the people what, they need, what you need to tell them, then that's it. You're dead. What did Moses do? Immediately he did that. That's the difference, Okay. Back to the Talmud. This is the statement of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva assumes one cannot outlive one preordained allotted lifespan. The rabbis say if he is deserving, God adds years to his, lifespan, to his lifespan. If he is not deserving, God reduces his lifespan. According to the rabbis, Isaiah's prophecy is referring to one who deserved to have extra years added to his allotted lifespan. And the verse in the Torah is referring to one who deserved to merely complete his lifespan. Added and complete. That's what they say. Okay. The rabbi said to Rabbi Akiva, how can you claim that one cannot outlive one allotted lifespan when there is a verse that states that Isaiah prophesied to Hezekiah as Hezekiah lay on his deathbed and it will add unto your days 15 years. Now, Rabbi Akiva was one of the greatest. Remember. Okay. So we, we can understand where this is going. Remember, when Moses was on Mount Sinai, God took him forward in time and showed him Rabbi Akiva. Moses was sitting in the eighth row of Rabbi Akiva's class, right? Eight. That's that holy number. And so Moses was terrified. He goes, the Torah that this man is teaching is insane. Why are you not giving him the Torah? Look how smart he is. And God said, he's teaching everything based on your Torah. So, yeah. Okay. Rabbi Akiva said to them, those additional years that God added to his lifespan are from his own allotted lifespan. Simply put, when Hezekiah sinned, God decreased, uh, uh, decreed that his lifespan be shortened. But when he repented, God allowed him to live out those years. Very simple. You see, there's always an answer if you look for it. And of course, if you truly want to find it. Most people just want to Con, uh, to confirm they want confirmation in their own personal belief, no matter how wrong or askew it may be. This is not only the Edomites, this is pretty much everybody, right? So if you can make the distinction between these two, you will save yourself a lot of time from, you know, well, how did Isaiah put it? Um, I know that he will not accept whatever explanation that I will say to him. And even if I do say it to him, I will make it uh, I will make him into an international transgressor since he will kill me anyway. So in other words, guys, honestly, don't get into it with people. You will know how when people genuinely want to learn. They will want to learn. They will come to you, right? But not prove that what I believe is false. That doesn't work. Or if people hold on to idolatrous beliefs, good luck with that. We cannot remove anyone's idolatrous beliefs, right? Doesn't matter how much text we show them. That is for God to do. So, so long as they're there, let God handle them. And if they are not removed from it, that's because they're not supposed to be removed from it. So, don't waste your time and move along. So, like we said, do what Isaiah did and just leave or run. It's not worth your time. <laughs>
Now, like we have said many times before, we must be very careful to judge our forefathers, right? As, um, as we were not there with them to actually witness what went down. We know we have the writings, but there's so much more than just, you know, you're reading a, a person's entire lifespan in a few verses. That's not a thing, right? I'll tell you a story. Did I tell you the story before? I don't recall. Anyway, um, uh, this was actually a, a famous story that went on in Israel here and it happened, I believe, sometime in the last uh, 20 years, 15 or 20 years, where um, uh, a, a rabbi in yeshiva, he was teaching about uh, the daughters of uh, Lot's daughters, right? And what they actually did. So they got their father drunk and he impregnated them. Why did they do that? Because they truly believed the world was ending and they had to start the world over with them. It's not something they wanted to do, but it's something they did to preserve our species. Okay? So it was done innocently. So this yeshiva student, apparently, he started cursing them out in class. That is, they started saying terrible things about them and all these things. And like, dude, you, you have to understand, even that was from God, right? That night, he went and he didn't care didn't accept any kind of rebuke, didn't give any apology, nothing. That night, he had a dream. Well, actually, I'll tell it like this. The next day, he came to his rabbi, and he's all pale. Rabbi, I had a dream last night. What happened? He goes, the two, Lot's two daughters came to me. They were glowing. Their eyes were glowing. They, they looked angelic, but also terrifying. And they said, who do you think you are to judge us? You have no idea. Get your affairs in order in 30 days' time. You're coming with us. So they went to uh, Rav, um, who was it? I can't remember right now. Oh, man. I can't remember his name right now. He, he, he died like a couple of years ago. I have one of his books for goodness sakes. Anyway, he's the ra that rabbi sent him to that rabbi and the rabbi said, yeah, dude, there is nothing that anybody could do for you. Get your affairs in order. And exactly 30, uh, 30 days later, it was it. That was it. He was taken. So let's tread carefully, shall we? And we will see exactly why. Okay. So today, the old school idolatry barely exists. We're talking about, I mean, maybe still in India or other far regions of the world, but we're talking about building statues and actually saying that these statues are God, right? The last time in the Western world we saw idolatry in the form of Menashe, building and bowing to statues made of wood, stone, silver, and gold, was when the Roman Empire went full Jesus mode, right? So, let's build statues of that guy and his virgin mother out of wood and stone, silver, and gold, and have people bow to that instead, right? Let's just collect it all to one instead of all the others. So, Christianity today only evolving within the times, as they don't worship the idols they made per se, but they do worship a man in the image of a man who they call God, right? This is also, obviously, it's idolatry. Although it's not identical to that form of idolatry back then, you better believe it's still idolatry straight up. Today, anyone who would build a statue with their hands and worship it, believing that it has powers, would be considered a fool, an imbecile by most. But if you build up an image in your mind and worship it, what, that's okay? Same thing. Anyway, do you want to know just how powerful idolatry was back then? From Masechet Sanhedrin 102 to 103, Rabbi Abau was accustomed to giving uh, lectures of great length about the three kings enumerated in the Mishnah. These were uh, uh, Yeravam, Menashe, and Ahab, right? Three wicked kings. So this guy taught of these three kings who have no share in the world to come. What? Wait. Yeravam. We learned all about him in the Red Series, the teaching titled The Secret of Mashiach ben Yosef, who never repented, by the way. Okay, you could learn all about him there. The second was King Ahab, who we've just learned about a couple of classes ago, who did repent and corrected his ways, but failed to correct the ways of his people, who he influenced. And the third, we have Menashe, son of Hezekiah. So he fell ill and he undertook that he would not lecture about those three kings. We're talking about the rabbi, the, uh, Rabbi Bahu. 
Once he recovered, he then lectured on the topic. His students said to him, did you not undertake that you will not lecture about them? Rabbi Abau said, did they repent that I will consider and refrain from condemning them? One day, Rav Ashi ended his lecture just before reaching the matter of the three kings. He said to his students, tomorrow we will lecture with our colleagues. Uh, we will lecture with our colleagues, the three kings. So he's calling these three kings our colleagues, our equals, who, although they were sinners, were Torah scholars like us. And this is absolutely true. We've already learned this about Ahab. Ahab was a great Torah scholar. We know that Yerovam was also a great Torah scholar. Solomon already saw this too. And now we're going to find out that Menashe was also a great Torah scholar. That night, Menashe, king of Judah, came and appeared to him in his dream. Menashe said to him angrily, You called us your colleagues and the colleagues of your father? How dare you characterize yourself as our equal? Menashe said to him, I will ask you, here, go ahead, smart man. Let me ask you this question. From where are you required to begin cutting the loaf of bread when reciting the blessing, right? Who brings forth bread from the earth? Hamotzi lechem minaretz. Ravashi said to him, I don't know. Menashe said to him, even this, from where you are required to begin cutting the loaf of bread when reciting the blessing? Who brings forth bread from earth? You did not learn, yet you call us your colleagues? Ravashi said to Menashe, teach me this halacha, and tomorrow I will lecture and cite it in your name during my public lecture delivered on the festival. Men and by the way, there's a whole, there, I heard a whole class about it. Whatever you receive in a dream, even if it could be Menashe, right? It could be the, the person. It doesn't count as halacha because it's a dream. We don't put that much on dreams, Okay. Again, I heard this fascinating lecture about it. It's not considered halacha. Maybe for other reasons, yes, maybe that caused them to investigate it, but okay. Anyway, Menashe said to him, one cuts the loaf where it crusts as a result of the baking, meaning from the side. Ravashi said to him, since you are so wise, what is the reason you, gazed, you engaged in idol worship? Answer me this, right? Menashe said to him, now listen, because this is a very famous thing. It's a very famous line, and you guys need to understand this, okay? Menashe said to him, had you been there at that time, you, great rabbi, at that time, you would have taken and lifted the hem of your cloak, it says lifting up your skirts, and you would have run after me to go do idolatry. That's how much, that's how strong the pull was. You understand that the pull towards this base idolatry was so strong that for a moment, it pulled away, for a moment, it pulled away in the golden calf, 3,000 men from Israel who had seen the hidden secrets of the universe during, during uh, uh, Mount Sinai. They saw this, they saw it till the ends of time, till the ends of the earth, all the secrets were revealed to them. And then they sinned with the golden calf. For a moment, yes? In other words, they didn't even partake in the stuff. They just, for a moment, they knew that it would do no good for them. They knew it was a lie, and yet they could barely help themselves. Like we know right now, for instance, when we do sins, we'll do the sins because maybe it's not so bad. We, you know, we, rational, uh, we rationalize our, uh, our, our behavior and say, okay, I could get away with this. I heard something, what was, it was really cute. I forgot, what, um, some guy said it. But in any case, when the truth is going to be revealed, when Mashiach comes and the truth is going to be revealed, doing sin is like putting your hand in a blender. No one would put a hand, their hand in a blender and turn it on. Of course not. That's bad for you. That's how we're going to realize how bad it is to sin. We're not going to want to sin, right? So that's how strong the pull was back then. Today, I would agree with our rabbis that the closest equivalent to what that pull would be, would be sexual immorality, okay? Look at the world today. See how sexualized everything has become in the most extreme of ways, right? It's become so mainstream that everyone is doing it without even doing it. It's not even like a thing. It just is. There is a reason that men in Masharim, they walk around with their eyes on the ground, God forbid they should stare at a woman, even if she's covered from head to toe, for this idol idolatrous type of pull. That's your idolatry of today. Once upon a time, they would place a woman 
once upon a time. When when was this? In the 70s, 80s, 90s even? They would place a woman on a car or in front of a car to try and sell the car. You know? Does the girl come with the car? Get the car, you might get the girl. Who knows? Or someone like that girl, right? This is using this to sell, right? Now they're just selling the women. Car, whatever, right? In fact, the women are selling themselves. They're doing this. Strong, independent women. Feminism has come back full circle, hasn't it now? Yeah, that's feminism. Okay. It's not, obviously. It's an affront to feminism. Idolatry and sexual immorality at this point, in this day and age, it would seem like they're almost one in the same. Everything. It's like you don't have to, I'm coming from Vegas, right? You don't have to go to Vegas to have that Vegas type of atmosphere. It is everywhere. It is in most homes. Fathers, watch your daughters. What's going on over there? Do we have a clue, maybe, a little bit, an idea of how strong the pull was for idolatry back in the day? A clue, maybe, right? Because the pull was beyond what anybody today would be able to stand. And that is what God was talking about when he told us, you shall not follow in their ways. That pull is strong, people. Those ways will lead you to be boiled alive. And so... They placed him in a massive pot of water and turned up the flames in order to boil him alive. And there, we're back in PDE, if you didn't notice, in the pot, he cried out to all the other gods that he sacrificed to, and not one of them answered him. What does this remind me of? I hope this reminds me of the same thing. We actually reviewed this, uh, this verse. This is from Micah 4, ch uh, chapter 4, verse 5. For all peoples shall go each one in the name of his God, but we will go in the name of the Lord, our God forever and ever. So in the end, like we said, go to the man that you were praying to all these years, cry out to him, see if he helps you. It's not going to happen, right? We will go with the name of, with our, uh, the name of our God. But these are the Gentile nations. Their root itself stems from idolatry. But what about Menashe, right? What about this guy? Though he drenched himself in the stench of idolatry, he and his kingdom, yet his root, his essence, his very makeup is not. He said to himself, I shall call upon the God of my forefathers with all my heart. Perhaps he will do wonders for me as he did for my father. Now you might be thinking to yourself, for goodness sake, how can one so wicked and evil be heard by God. Why would God even give, an, give him an audience after everything he had done? And what's worse, causing Israel to fall with him? Why would God listen to him? Did you hear that person over there who thinks you did really, really bad things, but they don't come close to how bad this guy lived? So I tell you, you are not alone in your thoughts, as some of our sages agree. From Sanhedrin 102b. He was called Menashe, Men Menashe because he forgot God, Nas, Nasa, Ya, not like carried elsewhere. Alternatively, he was called Menashe since he caused the kingdom of Israel to Hinsi, to turn away from their father who is in heaven. And from where do we derive that Menashe does not enter into the world to come? The Gemara answers, it is derived as, as it is written. Menashe was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he made an Asherah, and as did King Ahab of Israel. 2 Kings 21, 1-3. Just as Ahab has no share in the world to come, so too Menashe has no share in the world to come. Okay, whoa, well, hold up now. Wait a minute. First of all, we know that this is a tshuva story, as was with Ahab. They're tying them together. If Ahab, tshuva, if Ahab had tshuva, so does Menashe. And if Menashe has tshuva, so does Ahab. Wait for it. So, we know, like we said, this is a tshuva story. Second, how can we possibly get around what he did? How? Our text in Pirkei Durab Yeliezer explains. And he called upon the God of his forefathers with all his heart. And he, God, entreated him, and he heard his prayer, as said in 2 Chronicles 33, 13. And he prayed to him, and he accepted his prayer, and he heard his supplication. Amazing. God heard this man's cry? Oh, I'm sorry. 
somebody calling to me from a boiling pot of water. Oh, now you're coming to me. You see this? Because none of your other gods you honored are and followed your entire life. Well, because they didn't answer you. So now you're coming to me. I'm your default position. So now I'm supposed to listen to you. You who turned your back on me, who caused Israel to fall. That's what a dude would think. Okay. And yet we read, and he accepted his prayer and he heard his supplication. What did Pirkei Derby Eliezer add here to the verse in Chronicles? There's only one reason God answered him. Let just, I, again, I saw the first verse and looked in this Psalm. Psalms 119.2. Praiseworthy are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. Verse 10. With all my heart I searched for you. Do not cause me to stray from your commandments. Verse 58. I entreated you with all my heart. Favor me according to your word. Verse 145. I called with all my heart. Answer me, O Lord, I shall keep your statutes. Of course, there are so many more, right? But this, kids, listen up. This is that silver bullet. This is that get out of jail free card. But it has it has uh, to do with everything to do with the truth, okay? If you thought that you could live a life of sin and just repent when you needed it, right? You will not even get the opportunity to do tshuva and you will die within your sin. It's very different than living a life of sin because that's how it was and then doing tshuva. Two completely different things. And so the Gemara continues. Rabbi Yehuda says, Menashe does have a share in the world to come, as it is stated, and he prayed to him and he was entreated of him, and he heard his supplication and brought him back to Jerusalem unto his kingdom, as said in 2 Chronicles 33, 13. And he restored him to Jerusalem to his kingdom. So after all that, not only did he hear him, forgave him, saved him, but put him back as king in Jerusalem? Rabbi Yochanan says, and both of them, Rabbi Yehuda and the rabbis, who disagree with regard to whether Menashe has a share in the world to come, interpreted one and the same verse, as it stated, and I will make them into a horror for all the kingdoms of the earth on account of Menashe, son of Hezekiah. This is from Jeremiah 15.4, who came way later. Remember, Jeremiah was there to witness the destruction of the first temple. Menashe was king during the first temple. One sage, Rabbi Yehuda, holds that on account of Menashe, on account of Menashe, means that the Jewish people will be judged harshly, as ultimately one as wicked as Menashe repented, and they did not do so. And one sage, the rabbis, holds that on account of Menashe means because he did not repent and the people followed in his footsteps. So again, you out there, this ain't over yet. Sit tight and be encouraged. Rabbi Yochanan says, anyone who says that Menashe has no share in the world to come discourages Baalei Tshuva, those who do Tshuva, right? As Menashe, Menashe did do Tshuva. He repented and according to them is nevertheless excluded from the world to come. So the guy did Tshuva and he has no share in the world to come. As the Tana taught in Abraita before Rabbi Yochanan, Menashe repented for 33 years. 33 years he repented. As it is written, Menashe was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil, right? And he made an Asherah, as did Ahab, king of Israel, from 2 Kings 21, 1 to 3. How many years did Ahab reign? Uh, did uh, Menashe reign? He reigned 22, uh, excuse me, Ahab reigned for 22 years. Menashe reigned for 55 years. <clears throat> Deduct from them the 22 years during which he performed evil like Ahab, and 33 years remain for him to have repented. You see that? Menashe lived for 66 to 67 years. That's it. And he was repentant half his life. And only if you only count from the time that he was king, and we should only really count from the time he was 13, because again, you could do whatever up until 12, but from when you're 13 years old, that's when that's when things start to sit on you. That means he was in repentance for 33 out of 54 years. So here's your answer. Rabbi Yochanan says, in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, what is the meaning of that which is written, and he prayed to him, and he made an opening for him? Where is this opening? 
Same verse, 2 Chronicles 33, 13. So where do we see this opening? It says, and he prayed to him, and he accepted his prayer. In Hebrew, vayit palel elav, tefillah elav, to him, vayater lo, accepted his prayer and treated him, vayishmat achinato, right? And he heard his supplication. The word, so this is where it goes. Again, with no background, you you won't understand what's going on here. Let me give you background. The word vayater alludes to, uh, it alludes to this, right? That it was the opening was made. And to do be and to better understand what our sages are saying here, we need to see the same word during the same thing. What is this opening? What is this pathway? I recall learning this in Genesis 25, 21. And Isaac prayed to the Lord opposite his wife because she was barren. And the Lord accepted his prayer and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. God could deny Rivka's prayers. She was barren. It says right there. But he could not and would not deny Isaac because of the promise he made to Abraham, right? So we've learned that it was Isaac. We actually learned this in our classes. Isaac paved a spiritual pathway and Rivka's prayers ascended through that opening, reaching God who answered with Jacob and Esau. You understand? That's that opening that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said right over there in the text that God made specifically for Menashe. So back to the Talmud. Instead, he received his entreaty. Uh, it should have been written. Rather, this teaches us that the Holy One, blessed be he, crafted for him a type of opening in heaven in order to accept him in repentance. It was necessary for Menashe to enter the world to come in a clandestine manner, due to the attribute of justice that sought to prevent his entry by claiming that his sentence was irreversible. You did that, there's no coming back from that. You did that, there's no coming back from that, right? Hold on. And so what happened when God heard and answered Menashe? He took him out of the boiling pot in Babylon and returned him to his throne on Jerusalem. Just like that. At that moment, Menashe knew. What did he know? And he prayed to him and he accepted his prayer. What did Menashe know? And he accepted his prayer and he heard his supplication and he restored him to Jerusalem, to his kingdom. And Menashe knew that the Lord was God. Vaeda Menashe ki Adonai hu Elohim. As our text says, at that moment, Menashe said, there is justice and there is a judge. Yeshedin ve'yeshdayan. Vaidam Menashe ki Adonai hu Elohim, just like Jethro when he blessed God. He knew that Adonai, right? The Yudke Vavke, that's the name of mercy. Elohim is the name of judgment. Jethro understood that God's judgment is hidden within his mercy and his mercy is hidden within his judgment, right? Mercy is judgment and judgment is also mercy. Yes, you can have one God with different ways of doing things, with different aspects and attributes. And so everything that comes from God, which is everything that happens throughout this world, is perfect in every way. And if we don't understand it, Heavens forbid that God is off. Let those thoughts never cross your mind. I believe that God places us in specific situations so we can know just as, just as Jethro knew, a Baal Tshuva, just like Menashe, a Baal Tshuva, that God is all and there is none other than him. Enod milvado. And when I think of the things that I wrote over here, ironically, the verses that come up, right? Starting with the verse that Menashe chose to use to excuse the killing of his own grandfather Isaiah from Isaiah 55, which says, Seek the Lord when he is found, call him when he is near. The wicked shall give up this way, and the man of iniquity his thoughts. He's prophesying to his own grandson here. The wicked shall give up his way, and the man of iniquity his thoughts, and he shall return to the Lord, who shall have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. It's all about tshuva. 
at this point, I can just picture Menasha boiling in that pot, right? And his grandfather's words are piercing his very soul. Now, finally, Menasha sees the truth and he cannot be more humbled, as it said, and he was humbled before God. He cannot be more humbled than he was at that very moment. The king of Judah boiling in a pot of water as his enemies are all around him laughing and ridiculing him. He knew that he didn't need to understand everything that God said through the prophets, but only accept them, as Isaiah's words would continue to ring through his heart. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. For just as the rain and the snow fall from the heaven, and it does not return there unless it has satiated the earth, and fructified, and fructified its further, uh, and furthered its growth, and has given seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall be my word that emanates from my mouth; it shall not return to me empty, unless it has done what I desire and has made prosperous the one whom I sent it. Because Hezekiah and Isaiah knew that Manasseh was destined to be evil, they did everything they could in order to prevent this. And so in his earlier years, he too was a Torah scholar. The kings of Judah, the good ones, they were Torah scholars. You think father like Hezekiah and a grandfather like Isaiah wouldn't sit down and learn Torah with you and good midot, good attributes every single day? Of course they did this. And so like we said in his earlier years, he was also a Torah scholar. Though it was put on hold, it all, boom, it all came back to him, pouring like water to answer his heart's most burning desire. He said, despite everything I did, the man that I have become, is this it for me? Is this, is how, it, this is how it all ends in this boiling pot of water? Then in his darkest and lowest moment, he remembered the words of David, his father, as said in Psalms 51, 19. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. O oh God, you will not despise a broken and crushed heart. God is not a man that he should lie. So why does it focus on all his evil deeds, but not on his tshuva? The most wicked king, and the, the, this and the, that wicked, he did all these things. This just builds the aspect of tshuva. Tshuva is a given as we've learned, it is a condition upon which the world stands, upon which reality exists. So much so that God himself will carve out an opening to circumvent all the evil you may have done. And he will not deny your heart so long as it is all of it and so long as it is true. I said in Jeremiah 29, and you shall call me and go pray to me and I will hearken to you and you will seek me and find me for you will seek me with all your heart. Do not delay your return, my friends. There is uh, there was a way back home for Menashe. You better believe there's a way back home for you. You just got to go find it. But start now. That's our class for today, kids. So it's the uh, Muslims uh, Ramadan, Ramalama Ding Dong right now, officially starting today, according to the moon, according to the Hajjahs. And they are inciting extra violence from within our borders and Temple Mount and all that good stuff within our streets. So if you are in Israel, please be aware of your surroundings. Chaos is upon us. And if you are not in Israel, well, chaos is already upon you then. Anyway, you guys have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you really so much for being here every week with me. Be safe and have a Shabbat Shalom. God willing, I will be back next week to share more of this good, good stuff. Bye-bye.